Hello and welcome to everybody to this meeting of Cuba Solidarity Campaign organized as the fringe meeting of the National Education Union Conference. My name is Bernard Regan. I'm the secretary of the Cuba Solidarity Campaign and I'm also a member of the National Education Union. I'm one of the four national trustees of the union. There are also people who are involved in this webinar and listening in who are not members of the national union. So just to explain to them, the National Education Union is the biggest education union in Britain. Indeed, it's the biggest education union in Europe with around about half a million members. So you're very welcome to this fringe meeting, which is being organized as part of the annual conference of the National Education Union, which because of COVID is taking place online this year. We have a really interesting meeting lined up for you today which is celebrating and commemorating the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Literacy Campaign, which took place 60 years ago, which transformed the literacy rates on the island, eradicating illiteracy and bringing a massive transformation about to the lives of the Cuban people. We're going to begin by receiving a message of solidarity uh, and greetings from the General Secretary of the Cuban Teachers Union, Niurka Gonzalez Obrera, a friend of the NEU who has been in attendance, indeed, at our annual conferences uh, in the recent years. Hola, eh, un saludo solidario y un abrazo desde Cuba. Mi nombre es Niurka María González Orberá. Soy la secretaria del Sindicato Nacional de los Trabajadores de la Educación, la Ciencia y el Deporte en Cuba. Es el sindicato que reúne a todos los educadores, a todos los maestros, investigadores, científicos y deportistas en Cuba y el de mayor afiliación dentro de los 15 que hoy concentra la Central de Trabajadores en nuestro país. Desde acá queremos darle la bienvenida a todas las delegados y delegados a la conferencia anual eh, del Reino Unido, de, de los maestros de su organización. También es para nosotros muy importante, muy gratificante estar celebrando también los más de 25 años de relación que tiene nuestro sindicato con su organización. Queremos también agradecer el apoyo de la campaña de solidaridad con Cuba hacia la eliminación del brutal y genocida bloqueo que por más de 60 años los gobiernos de Estados Unidos han impuesto a nuestro país, eh, con el cual quieren vencernos, pero nunca lo podrán lograr porque estaremos siempre firmes a nuestros principios. Nosotros en el mes de noviembre estaremos desarrollando, celebrando el 60 aniversario de la gran campaña nacional de alfabetización. Con esta campaña Cuba se colocó como el primer país de América Latina que pudo alfabetizar a todos sus habitantes. También estaremos eh, realizando una gran jornada de celebración por esta eh, gran campaña de alfabetización. En el mismo mes de noviembre, nosotros celebraremos también el 60 aniversario de la constitución de nuestro sindicato, del Sindicato de la Educación, la Ciencia y el Deporte. Y coincidiendo con el 60 aniversario de la constitución de nuestro sindicato, si nos permite la pandemia, estaremos celebrando nuestra segunda conferencia nacional, a la cual están todos eh, invitados. Nosotros, eh, desde acá, desde Cuba, queríamos también, y ya en lo más particular, mandar un saludo solidario a Kevin, a Rian, a Rob, a Natacha, a Mary, a Bernard, a Alfa, nuestro gran amigo también, que está desarrollando su tesis sobre la campaña de alfabetización y al cual le vamos a dar, le hemos estado dando todo nuestro apoyo. Y a todas y todos, les deseamos muchos éxitos en su conferencia, que los intercambios entre los maestros, entre los profesores y las regiones propicie una mayor calidad de la educación. Eh, muchos éxitos, ojalá nos podamos ver muy pronto, cuídense mucho. Abrazos solidarios desde Cuba. Eh, Cuba nunca defraudará la solidaridad que el Reino Unido y sus organizaciones han mostrado con nosotros, porque el futuro es nuestro, porque el futuro es de los que hacen el bien. Un abrazo, los quiero mucho. Chao, ojalá podamos vernos pronto. Muchas gracias. Gracias. And now thanks to Nierka and to all of the members of the Cuban Teachers Union who 
greet us when we send delegations with great deal of warmth and a great deal of care and affection looking after the delegations who go on visits to schools and I know that everybody who has been on those delegations can testify to that. As Nyurka said this is the 60th uh, anniversary of the Literacy Brigade and we'll be hearing directly from people who participated in it uh, later on during the meeting. I want to, having thanked Nyurka, I want to uh, invite Kevin Courtney, the General Secretary of the National Education Union, also to say a few words. Over to Kevin. Hi, uh, I'm really pleased to be speaking to this fringe meeting of NU delegates who want to do something to so, so coordinate action in solidarity with Cuba and against the 60 year old illegal blockade. I'm really proud that the NEU is affiliated to the Cuba Solidarity Campaign and that we've been able to work together on so many great projects in solidarity with education in Cuba. This year, we celebrate the 60th anniversary of Cuba's Great Literacy Campaign, which was one of the first acts of the new government after the revolution of 1959. The campaign saw thousands of mainly young volunteers head out into the countryside to teach, to teach millions of poor Cubans how to read and write. Those volunteers did so at enormous personal risk. Many were attacked and some killed by anti-Cuban mercenaries who targeted the volunteers because they were easy targets and hoping that the murders would spread fear amongst those who supported the new government. But that campaign was the first indication that the new government wanted education for all to be a priority. And today we can see a government where when there is a will, political will to do it, education can be a priority. It can be free, it can be universal, it can be inclusive for all ages and abilities. Over the past five years, the NEU has sent delegations of UK teachers to Cuba during their October half term to visit and learn firsthand about the education system there, but also to find out about the effects of the illegal blockade and the need for solidarity. Each year, our members return home, inspired by the example that Cuba shows, and many become increasingly active in the union at home. They come back talking about the inclusivity of Cuban education, the fact that so many of Cuba's education leaders are women and so many are black. Our union's got a proud history of internationalism, and I was proud to support Cuba Solidarity's campaign to end the open university ban on Cuban students in 2017. That was such an outrageous manifestation of the extraterritorial extra nature of the blockade. But working together, we helped to overturn that ban. More recently, NEU members have fundraised and paid for 30 refurbished braille machines to be sent to the island to help children in the able Santa Maria, Maria schools for the visually impaired. These machines are US made and it's shocking, astonishing that Cuba is unable to buy them or buy spa, spare parts for them due to the blockade. So the small contribution that our members have made is directly breaking the blockade as well as helping education in Cuba. You know that we also worked with Cuba Solidarity to send 8,000 musical instruments to Cuba as part of the Play for Cuba appeal. And it was wonderful to wave off two huge shipping containers from our Liverpool conference and then see all the pictures and testimony from children and teachers in Cuba thanking us for, for our solidarity. But above all, it's that illegal blockade that we need to challenge. And I'm really proud that our union, our members, as well as the vast majority of trades unionists within the TUC are standing shoulder to shoulder with our Cuban brothers and sisters in the struggle against this illegal and cruel US blockade. Thanks once again for inviting me to make this small contribution to the Fringe meeting and best wishes to all of you in a good meeting and then taking forward action in solidarity with the Cuban people. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much uh, for that contribution, Kevin. Um, 
I think it's really noticeable when we go on delegations that the Cuban people are entirely appreciative of the work of the National Education Union and of other unions and the kind of practical concrete solidarity that Kevin was talking about. The braille machines which we've seen being used in uh, schools like the Abel Santa Maria School for the Blind in, uh, in Havana uh, and the musical instruments which we indeed have seen students playing uh, in music schools in Cuba. So it's evidence that you know solidarity from the NEU has been really strong and really practical. Um, as Kevin said, uh, of course, Cuba faces a massive blockade. And over the last period, under President Donald Trump in the United States of America, that blockade has become even harsher, with 90 new measures, no less, being introduced by Trump, uh, tightening the blockade, making it difficult for Cuba to engage in financial transactions abroad, and putting colossal burdens on the Cuban economy on top of a situation which everybody here will appreciate, of course, Cuba too is facing the challenge of COVID. So it's facing a really difficult time at this point in time, but it is taking care of all of its students, all of its young people, and of all its, its community. As Kevin said, this meeting is about the literacy campaign, the 60th anniversary and the celebration of that. Uh, so I'm very pleased now at this point to invite our next speaker, uh, Alpha Kane. Alpha has been on delegations to Cuba many times, going back over many years, and is undertaking a doctoral research uh, attached to Nottingham University, but working with the help of Cuban colleagues, uh, as Nierka said, and supported by the teachers in Cuba, to undertake work which I'm sure will be very, very important and very interesting in bringing to light the full extent to which the literacy campaign had a massive impact on Cuba in all sorts of ways. So Alpha, please talk. Thank you very much indeed, Bernard. Thank you very much. Um, the Cuban literacy campaign was more than teaching the illiterate to read and write. It has a deep rooted Cuban history and tradition. It was a process of discovering one's own patria. Primarily, it was about human dignity and its moral imperative rested on the idea that it was for all. Education has featured prominently in the manifestos of Cuban leaders of the wars of independence against Spain. Felix Varela spoke of popular education and the concept of patriotism. Jose Martí followed that patriotic concept of education and declared that to be educated is the only way to be free. In his allegato, Historia me absolvera, history will absolve me, his courtroom speech after the rebel attack of the Moncada Barak in 1953, Fidel Castro said, a revolutionary government would undertake the integral reform of the education system. What is inconceivable is that 30% of our peasants cannot write their name and that 90% of them know nothing of Cuba's history. Fidel spoke to voluntary teachers on the 20th of August, 1960 and said, el año que viene, Vamos a librar la batalla contra el analfabetismo. El año que viene establecemos una meta, liquidar el alfabetismo en nuestro país. ¿Cómo? Movilizando al pueblo. In this speech, the Cuban leaders speak of launching a battle against illiteracy. He mentioned the necessity to create a revolutionary consciousness. The necessity for every single illiterate to undertake or to pledge to learn to read and write. When a month later, he addressed the United Nations on the 26th of September, 1960, he said, next year, our people propose to launch an all out offensive against illiteracy with the ambitious goal of teaching every illiterate person to read and write. Organization of teachers, students, workers, the entire population are preparing themselves for an intensive campaign and within a few months, Cuba will be the first country in the Americas to be able to claim that it has not a single illiterate inhabitant. Dr. Raul Ferrer, one of the main architects of the Cuban literacy campaign and adult education said, 
The goal of the campaign was always greater than to teach people how to read and write. The dream was to enable those portion of the population that had been most instrumental in the process of the revolution to find a common bond, a common spirit, a common goal. The peasants discovered the word, the students discovered the poor. Together, they all discovered their own patria. Again, the patriotic idea of the literacy campaign. The target was to foster a culture of mutual learning and understanding between urban and rural people, a symbiosis of purpose, a Cuban identity, what Professor Capsia of Nottingham University described as Cubania. A former brigadista, Armando Valdez said, I could never have known that people live in such condition. I was a child of an educated, comfortable family. I, those months for me were like the stories I've heard about conversion to a new religion. It was for me the dying of an old life and the start of something absolutely new. When I first saw the desperation of those people, people who had so little, no, they did not have so little, they had nothing. I did not need to read this in Marx, in Lenin, or even in Martin, he said. I did not need to read of what I saw before my eyes. Another one said, I learned a lot. I went to teach them, but they taught me many things I did not know. I gave them the light of learning, but they taught me how to be a person. For me, the literacy campaign could be summed up in five Spanish words. Number one, llamado, the call. The literacy campaign was successful in demonstrating the popularity of the revolution and the ability of the leadership to mobilize the entire people for the greater good. 100,000 Coronado Benitez brigadistas, young people, enthusiastic, energetic, passionate, a kind of ethical exhilaration, as Jonathan Kozol called it, described it in his book, Children of the Revolution. 35,000 school teachers, popular brigadistas, 121,000 alphabetizados populares, 15,000 workers, brigade, patria o muerte. And number two, compromiso, commitment. The volunteers were totally committed to the task despite the counter-revolutionary attack of Playa Giron on the 17th of April, 1961. They continued teaching. However, as Kevin said, there were many martyrs. Unidad, number three. The literacy campaign was a nation building exercise. It was successful in uniting urban and rural life. It was successful in transforming all those who participated as teachers and students. Number four, patria, revolutionary consciousness. It was successful in desegregating Cuba along gender, race, and class. Cuba became the patria for all its citizens and against all form of them discrimination. And finally, number five, Victoria, victory. Before 1959, 23.6% of the population were illiterate. 500,000 young children did not attend school. 10,000 teachers were unemployed. At the end of the campaign, the illiteracy rate was down to 3.9%. Functional literacy was achieved the level required by UNESCO to declare a country free of illiteracy. On the 22nd of December, 1961, at the Plaza de la Revolution, Cuba became the first country in the Americas to be free of illiteracy, a total success. And um, I had the opportunity and the you know, honor to uh, visit Cuba uh, many times, as Bernard said, but last year I was there in January and February to do my research. And I met many, many people and um, this is a book that they used for the, uh, in 1961, this was the manual. And then you're gonna see the, uh, the, the, the that's maybe another time. This is um, one brigadista I met in, uh, Ciego de Avila. And this is another one who said he learned how to actually uh, ride a horse. Um, this was in Moron, the municipality of Moron. And this is a flag that shows Cuba Territorio, uh, uh, Territorio Libre de Analfabetismo, free of illiteracy. And then she was a brigadista as well. And then this also was uh, another brigadista who, um, who uh, was uh, young, who showed me the photo when she was a brigadista there. And um, I have got um, also one very important one. If you, these are brigadistas from Santa Clara, 
the, when we went to visit also Che Guevara's. Um, uh, and here we have final one. This Brigadista was in the relay team in 1968 of Mexico. His name is Juan Morales. Um, Juan is here. And he um, was the actual, if you go to the museum, literacy museum, you will see that uh, Juan poster, this poster is Juan. He invited me in his place in Havana and he when came second after the Americas. And this is when the, the Americans, when they won the relay, did their black power thing, the John Carlos and Tommy Smith. So um, now I would like to um, introduce two more brigadistas. Um, Maria Luisa is from Santiago de Cuba. She joined the campaign when she was 21. She's now 80 years old. And she is the mother of the National General Secretary of the National Tribune Teachers Union. Um, and Lila Vati, um, a very, very, very good friend of mine, who joined the campaign when she was 15. Um, she, you will hear her, and then she's from Havana. She invited me to her place and then and explained everything to me, and she was very helpful with my research. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bernard. Thank you, Alfred. I think we're now going to see the film of the interviews. Hola, buenas tardes. Qué placer poder felicitarlos en primer lugar por este premio que les ha otorgado el Instituto Cubano de Amistad con los Pueblos a esta campaña de solidaridad con Cuba del Reino Unido. Me gustaría hablar con ustedes de dos alumnos míos, el mayor, el de más edad, 70 años, Juan Leiva, de una inteligencia notable que aprendió enseguida a leer y a escribir y que me hacía muchas preguntas de historia, de geografía, de todo. Le interesaba mucho el movimiento de los planetas, las relaciones entre la luna, la tierra, el sol. Y yo tuve que estudiar y emplearme a fondo para poder saciar toda su ansia de conocimiento. Mi otra alumna, la más joven, de los cinco alumnos que tuvo, Julia, que le llamábamos la negra, ella me llevaba dos años. Yo me fui a alfabetizar con 15 años, ahí en la campaña cumplí 16 y Julia tenía 18. Totalmente habíamos vivido vidas diferentes. Yo era una estudiante y ella con 18 años, una campesina, ya tenía un niño. Aprendió muy rápido. Más que alumna y maestra, nos hicimos amigas. Y tuve la satisfacción, al volver a ese lugar 25 años después, en cuanto Julia se enteró que yo estaba ahí, vino a verme y cuál fue mi alegría y mi orgullo cuando me dijo que estaba trabajando en la oficina del Policlínico de Puerto Padre se siguió superando y trabajaba en la administración de ese politécnico. Eso es un orgullo que, tiene, que teníamos todos los brigadistas, porque en, una época, en aquella época tú dabas todo lo que tú tenías con la pasión juvenil, el momento de izar la bandera donde se declaraba Cuba territorio libre de analfabetismo, fue de un júbilo inolvidable una de las emociones más grandes que hemos sentido en nuestras vidas. Pero el minuto de silencio donde le rendimos homenajes a los mártires de nuestra campaña de alfabetización fue impactante. Y siempre estaremos en deuda con ellos. Esta foto que les quiero mostrar fue en ese minuto de silencio en la plaza. No se oía ningún ruido, nada. Fue algo muy, muy emocionante. Después yo tuve el honor y el privilegio de ser seleccionada para decir las palabras en nombre de los 100.000 brigadistas Conrado Benito. Realmente para mí Siempre ha constituido una gran, un gran orgullo haber dicho esas palabras 
en la plaza, pero le hubiera podido tocar, hubiera podido ser seleccionado cualquiera de los 100.000 brigadistas, porque todos cumplimos bien con nuestra, con nuestra tarea. Yo no estaba nada nerviosa a los 15, 16 años, no te pones nerviosa, estás en la Plaza de la Revolución, ciento y pico mil personas ahí mirándote al lado de Fidel, pero yo no estaba nerviosa, yo lo que estaba era emocionada por ese momento. Fidel se me acercó antes de hablar y me dice, ¿no estás nerviosa? Yo le dije que no. Me dijo, pues mira, yo me pongo nervioso cada vez que voy a hablar. Le digo, ay, yo no lo creo. Yo no le creo, Fidel, yo pienso que eso es, te lo dice, para darme confianza. También se lo dijo a otra brigadista que habló en nombre de, los, de las brigadas estudiantiles internacionales, porque con, con los estudiantes cubanos participaron muchos estudiantes de diferentes países. Si quieren algún otro intercambio, por favor, Alfa sabe cómo localizarme. Y les sigo deseando muchos éxitos a esa campaña de solidaridad de Cuba con el Reino Unido. Muchas gracias y muchas felicidades a ustedes. Mi nombre es María Luisa Orberá Chavarría. Tengo 80 años y vivo en Santiago de Cuba. Fui una de las compañeras que participó en la campaña de alfabetización convocada por el Estado. ¿Cómo fue su experiencia en la campaña de, de alfabetización? ¿Cuál fue la razón para incorporarse? ¿Qué, ¿Quién la convocó a usted a, 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 esa, a ir a esa alfabetización? Bueno, fue una gran experiencia porque bueno, en esos, en esos años no había salido de mi hogar y el Estado convocó esa campaña para que había muchos campesinos que no sabían leer ni escribir y necesitaban del concurso de nosotros, de la ayuda de nosotros, los alfabetizadores. ¿Cuántos años tenía usted? En aquel tiempo yo tenía 21 años. ¿Y era la primera vez que usted salía era de su casa? Era la primera vez que yo salía de mi hogar y me iba al campo yo no conocía la vida campesina. Y usted allí con los campesinos que usted alfabetizó, ¿cómo fue? ¿Compartió con ellos su vida igual Fue que una ellos? vida maravillosa con los campesinos, me acogieron muy bien, yo me acogí muy bien con ellos. Su vida, me acogía su vida del campo y, y me es... olvidé de la vida de la ciudad. ¿Y usted se sintió contenta? ¿Cuál fue el legado que dejó en usted en su vida esa, esa participación en esa obra tan grandiosa de la revolución? Yo me sentí allí en ese lugar muy contenta, fui muy bien acogida. Eh, aprendí muchas cosas que fuera del hogar, de la vida de la ciudad, uno no aprende su vida, su costumbre, lo que ellos comían. Y yo me adapté muy bien a esa vida. Ellos me querían muchísimo. ¿Usted Cuba cree que bien. eso fue muy importante para nuestro país? Claro que sí, porque eso ayudó a, al desarrollo de nuestro país. Muchas gracias, María Luisa, eh, esta, por esta entrevista. Nuestra felicitación por haber participado en esa gran campaña de, de alfabetización que significó tanto para nuestro país. Gracias a usted. Thank you, Alpha, for those uh, interviews. That was extremely interesting. I think the thing that you said, which struck me as very important, is the way in which this literacy campaign was a whole social movement involving the whole of the country that everybody was engaged and it broke down the sort of barriers uh, that imperialism and that uh, had been Im imported there by the Spanish, uh, Spanish imperialism and by the United States in terms of the divisions between people. Some of the uh, brigadistas who went on the uh, teaching into the countryside were very young one of them as young as 12 years of age. Uh, so it was a real massive movement. And it was also one that involved workers. Uh, workers uh, took on teaching uh, fellow workers in their own factories who were not literate and to bring them in. So it wasn't simply kind of students and teachers going out, but it was the whole community engaged in it. And I think it's a, 
it's a testimony to the importance of education uh, that Cuba has retained right to this present day. The fact that it spends more on education of its GDP than any other country in the world. It still sees education and health, of course, as being a huge priority, much, much more. Something like, I think it's 12 or 13%, which is compared to Britain, which is around about, I think, 5 or 6%, if my, if my figures are correct. So you can see that you know education is regarded as extremely uh, important for life and life uh, as a lifelong issue, not simply something for formal, uh, you know, statutory education. And of course, uh, it's free in Cuba. Uh, children don't have to pay for anything to do with their schooling, uh, and nobody has to pay for education. And that includes uh, students who go to university and students who stay on to do doctorates. Uh, in Cuba. I'm sure uh, Alpha will tell you he's having to pay sums of money uh, to do his PhD here in Britain, uh, but in Cuba it's absolutely free that people continue studying and undertake um, uh, PhD studies, uh, research studies, as well as uh, people becoming graduates and so on. So Cuba is a really integral and important uh, part of life. As Kevin said in his contribution, uh, Cuba, of course, as I mentioned, faces a colossal ongoing blockade. And that's the reason why the Cuba Solidarity Campaign exists, is to oppose that blockade and to demand the right of the Cuban people to determine their future, to determine their economic, social and political paths, not to have that imposed by the United States of America, which spends billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars, in trying to subvert Cuba and deny Cuba the right to do that. So it's important that we have trade unions like the NEU affiliated to the Cuba Solidarity Campaign, which has more than 20 national unions affiliated. Uh, and that includes you know, all of the major unions and the overwhelming majority of unions which represent the mass of trade unionists in this country. So I would like to ask you at this point to get your local district of the NEU to affiliate to the Cuba Solidarity Campaign. If you're not personally a member, I'd invite you to join and to sign up for our news information, which you'll get on a regular basis, telling you what's happening inside Cuba as well. But as we said early on, uh, the NEU has been involved in sending delegations to Cuba. And I think they've been very important in allowing people the opportunity to see uh, the benefits and the fruits of the literacy campaign that Alpha has been talking about and the way in that's continued today and the way in which education is something which the whole community is involved in. So I'm very pleased to introduce as our next contributor, Karen Parkin, who's a member of the executive committee of the National Education Union. Uh, so welcome to Karen. Thanks, Bernard. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I am a joint district secretary in Wigan, NEU Wigan. I'm a primary school teacher for about 30 years. Um, and as Bernard said, I'm on the executive for District 5, which covers um, most of Greater Manchester and some parts of Cheshire. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to participate in the 2016 delegation when we were still the NUT. And I want to stress that um, these delegations run by the NEU um, I'm glad, glad that they've carried on um, now that we are the NEU, but they're open to all members. You don't have to be an executive member. You don't have to be um, particularly active in your district to in, in order to apply to go on one of these delegations. Um, it is open to ordinary members. And I'll speak more at the end about how you, you can apply if you want to. Um, I'd never been to Cuba before. I'd had friends who'd been and came back. And as well as the reports of what a lovely country it was and how friendly the Cubans were and what a warm welcome they'd received. My friend said to me, you like this, Karen. The, the, everybody is literate. They can all read and write. It's a, it's a practically 100% rate of literacy in, in what I thought was a, a very poor country. Um, and that, that really piqued my interest. Um, and Alpha's told us a little bit about how they achieved that. Um, I really wanted to find out as a, as a primary school teacher, as someone who teaches children to read and write, I, I was really curious to find out how Cuba 
had done this, um, particularly given all the uh, turmoil that they faced. Um, and I looked up our literacy rate in the UK, the sixth largest, uh, sixth wealthiest um, country in the world. Um, and I read, according to the National Literacy Trust, that 16% of UK adults are described as functionally illiterate. So as a comparison, that's, that's um, a stark contrast. Uh, why don't we have a, a literacy rate of 100%? So I was intrigued to go and the, the delegation uh, answered all those questions and more the trip. There were about 20 of us went, um, led by Bernard. Um, all NUT members, all teachers at the time, we were a, a teachers union, um, from all sectors um, of education in the UK. Um, and I, I think we, we all had a, a, a reason to go, things that we wanted to find out about, and I can wholeheartedly say none of us were disappointed. It was a life-changing experience. It, it's coming up to almost five years ago since I went to Cuba. But the memories I have and the, the inspiration I took from that trip has stayed with me. I made friends um, at that time uh, that I'm still friends with now in Cuba and in, in our own union. And I did become very active. I joined the Cuba Solidarity Campaign. I, I encouraged my branch to affiliate. Um, and in fact, I think it was my work, uh, in, in uh, my international work that led to me applying to be on the executive. So it, it had far reaching implications um, for me to go on that delegation. It was a busy week. This, this is not a holiday week. Um, it is in half term, October half term, um, have lots of energy. Uh, it's a full itinerary, but you get to see uh, inside schools. Uh, we met with trade unionists, all different settings. And it was fascinating. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to go in anybody's classroom. Um, if you work in education, teachers or support staff, it's always good to have, go and have a nosy round, see how other people do it. We got to see how they do it in another country. So included in the week, uh, and if, if you go on one of these delegations or if you've been, you'll know that uh, we, we got to visit a primary school, the mainstream primary school, which had its own outdoor swimming pool. Uh, it might not have had a functioning air conditioning system, but it did have an outdoor swimming pool. They do have better weather than us, of course, um, and that got daily use by all the children. How wonderful. We visited a secondary school, a university in Pinar del Rio. Um, a very uh, uh, poignant uh, was our visit to the Abel Santa Maria School for the Visually Impaired. Uh, that had a real impact on a lot of us. Um, the, the children were, were very happy, very, very well cared for, very well um, taught, but the so, so poorly resourced in what they, uh, they're trying to achieve um, in very difficult circumstances. And we were the first delegation that took along some braille machines. Um, as as uh, I think Kevin described, the um, the braille machines that they have. They, they're very resourceful, the Cubans. They will make do and mend, but with the best will in the world, ultimately, you know, things do have a shelf life. So we took uh, some braille machines for the UK and they were so very gratefully received uh, and so very great, uh, so very obviously needed by those children and those teachers in that school. So it was very heartening that, that we could do that as a, an act of friendship and an act of solidarity. And as Kevin said, it's a little, another chip away at the, at the blockade that, that, that we want to see ended. Uh, we visited a music school and an art school. So specialist schools, but these were not fee paying establishments. As Bernard said, education in Cuba is free to all at all levels. Um, the, 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 uh, the music and, and art schools are open to those children who show a particular aptitude in those fields. And so they're invited to, to learn at the school. They learn a regular curriculum alongside their specialist subject. Uh, and it was wonderful. Um, we were greeted as we were at many of the schools with a, a musical performance at the music school. Uh, there were a wealth of uh, instruments that they could learn to play. And as someone previously mentioned, 
after that delegation, we, um, CSC and the NEU, collaborated to collect musical instruments uh, from the UK, unwanted, unused, and they were delivered to Cuba. And I, I know, again, they were very gratefully received. But how sad that we could collect so many musical instruments. Why aren't they being used in this country? Um, you know, it, it, during the week of that delegation, it, it was impossible not to compare the, our two systems. And we might have thought that the UK system was better. Well, we may be better resourced, but is it better fundamentally? Do our children have a broad and balanced curriculum? It says, it says they do on paper, but in practice, is that the truth? I suspect not. Um, so the, the music and the arts is very important uh, and is prioritised um, in, in all aspects of Cuban life. I was really struck by that. As I said, every school, we were greeted by a performance uh, from the children of singing or dancing or playing musical instruments. It was kind of the way that they welcomed us and, and it was wonderful. Um, The, uh, the, the, all the children wear school uniforms as well in Cuba. Um, I was a bit surprised at that, I think. They have a, a, a national uniform for primary children, a national uniform for secondary age children. And that's issued free of charge, again. Um, compare that to UK provision. Uh, we ask our children to wear school uniforms, but parents struggle to pay for those. Uh, the cost of a, a blazer alone for secondary school can be very expensive. So again, a comparison between our two systems with Cuba coming out more favorably. School meals, free for all, all school children in education in Cuba, which is very much what should happen here. We, we only have to think about the campaign that Marcus Rashford led last summer um, in order to get our school children fed during the summer holidays and for which we've just quite rightly given him the Fred and Ann Jarvis Award today. Those children would have gone hungry had he not led that campaign. And you know how can, how can we live with that? That children in our in our country in the UK might have gone hungry, do go hungry in the holidays. Holiday, why is holiday hunger even a thing? It doesn't exist in in Cuba because the Cuban people's basic needs are all met. Um, Back to education, it clearly is a priority. As Bernard said, uh, Cubans spend about 13% of their GDP on education. We spend around 6% and it shows in Cuba. The, the children had such high aspirations as well. When we asked them in the secondary schools, what do you want to be when you leave school? It was marine biologist, doctor, chemist. High aspirations that these children had. Um, and I'm not sure I, I hear that as frequently as, as we in this country as we did that week. Education is a community effort. Uh, pair, it, it, it's a community endeavor to educate children. It's everybody's responsibility. Something that stuck out at me was the fact that parents um, take time off work. They're allowed time off work to go to parent teacher conferences in Cuban schools because it's important. It's not something that's relegated to the end of the day where after parents have done their work, that they go along to the school to speak to the teachers. It's, it's given importance, it's given a status and it's done as part of the working day. There is wraparound care for children, uh, for those families that need it and it's free, of course, um, either side of the school day. <clears throat> consult my notes. I don't, want, I don't want to miss anything out. I'm, it's easy for me to go on and on about all the wonderful things that I saw in Cuba, um, but, but I won't. Um, yes, we also met with the, the, the Cuban Trade uh, Unionist, Union of Teachers and the Federation of Cuban Women. Um, and the, the, in all the places we visited, it was Ask Us Anything. The Cubans wanted to talk to us about their system. They wanted us to ask questions, any questions. They were very happy to tell us, even the difficult questions, they were very happy to discuss, very open, very honest. Um, uh, and, we, and we learned a lot from them. So how can you join a delegation? Well, um, there's a link gonna go up at the end um, 
to the NEU's main website, which has an international section. Uh, and as was previously mentioned, up till COVID, we were running annual delegations in the October half term. Uh, you can apply with a, a short statement about why you want to apply, what you're interested in. Um, you need support from your local branch and uh, the, the district secretary will, will have to sign to say that you are a, a, a candidate. There is some funding required, uh, half as of which is met by the National Education Union and half of which might be met by your district or um, you may be expected to contribute some yourself, but you don't have to pay for the whole thing yourself. The main requirement that we ask if you're going on an NEU delegation is that you'll come back and talk about it and you'll share the message of what it's like to be an educator in Cuba. Um, I'm doing this now. I've been to other branches to talk about Cuba. Uh, many of the people that went on delegations have written articles. Uh, we all produced reports. Each delegation produces a report. This was ours in 2016, valuing education, which is what the Cubans do. Um, and I think each delegation has produced a report since. There's some of us, some of you are on this call. Um, uh, and it's, it's an interesting read. If you're thinking of going on a delegation, have a look through one of these reports and it'll give you a real flavor of what to expect. Um, uh, just one last thing, uh, listening to conference today, um, this, this was a, a, an overriding um, impression that I know a lot of our delegation came back with. And that was uh, the impression of uh, the, the relationship between educators and the government. In one of our meetings with the uh, Cuban teacher trade unions, we asked how did they manage to influence government policy in Cuba in such a way that it was became so effective that the educators seem happy with it, the children certainly seem happy with it. There seemed to be a good relationship between the powers that be and the educators. And, and we wanted to know how, how did they manage that? And they didn't understand, the Cubans didn't quite understand what we meant because they said, well, we are the educators. We make the policy and then we tell the government. I mean, imagine that, what a, what a revelation. And they, they, they thought we weren't being serious. You know, they were laughed at that, to think that politicians who have never been educators would, would have such a, an influence on, on policy and make policy was absolutely ridiculous to them. Um, and we realized that it was ridiculous to us as well. Um, and listening to, today, to today's conference where we do not have that relationship with the government. Government don't even listen to educators. Um, <laughs> at best, they don't listen. At worst, we're called the blob or we're called the enemies of promise um, or saboteurs. So in so many ways, Cuba has got, got it right with education, not everything, but in so many ways. And, and we brought far more back than, than we took with us. Uh, highly recommend that you search out an opportunity to go on a delegation, whether it's with the NEU or with another union or with the Cuba Solidarity Campaign itself, which runs them frequently in, in normal times as well. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you very much indeed, Karen. And just to uh, add to what you said, um, if people would like to find out more about delegations and people's views about their experiences, I can recommend this book highly, which is uh, a book jointly produced with the National Education Union and Cuba Solidarity. I'm sorry if the picture isn't quite coming across, uh, but it's available through the Cuba Solidarity Campaign website, and it covers a wide range of issues to do with education, to do with pedagogy, to do with race, decolonization, LGBT rights, and a whole host of other things, education, democracy, the role of trade union. This is, and it's written by people who were on delegations and as Karen said, people were asking all sorts of questions and were entirely uh, free and able to ask anything they liked. And the Cubans were very open about discussing and responding uh, to those questions. Just before uh, we go on and take, uh, thank you. Sorry, I should thank Karen very much for that contribution. Um, I just want to mention one or two things that we'd like you to do specifically. One is that there's an early day motion which is being promoted 
in the House of Commons. That is a motion calling on the British government to uh, engage positively with Cuba in terms of international cooperation uh, and also calling on the administration of President Biden to remove the uh, block blockade that is being carried on. As I said, under uh, President Donald Trump, things actually got considerably worse uh, with uh, money being uh, closed down and uh, transactions being hindered, uh, even to the extent that banks here in Britain are refusing to uh, transfer monies across to Cuba. So it's an extremely serious issue. So we'd like you to encourage your member of parliament to sign that early day motion as a way of expressing solidarity with Cuba and calling on the British government uh, to refuse to uh, be part of the blockade that's being carried out. We, of course, everybody I think hopes that uh, President Biden will uh, not be as aggressive towards Cuba as Donald Trump was, but I think it's important to realize that uh, nothing has happened as yet, and he's been in office for some months, and yet the restrictions that were introduced by Donald Trump are still there, and I can assure you that they're really very draconian. So we want to uh, get you to ask your member of parliament to sign that early day motion as a way of conveying uh, to our government and also to the United States uh, government uh, that we want the blockade to end. Even under President Obama, the blockade actually continued because although the president has a certain amount of latitude uh, to vary aspects of the blockade, centrally it's embodied in legislation that went through the House of Congress and uh, needs to be rescinded by Congress if it's to be fully removed. So it's important that we recognize that the blockade is continuing. And I think people uh, you know, should have a look at that because it is uh, a very serious issue. Um, I want to just respond to some questions and I'll ask and invite Alpha and, and, and Karen as well to make comment uh, that have been put in the, uh, in the apps and in the chat uh, during the meeting. Uh, firstly, in relation to COVID, I know that, that the question has been asked, how, are, how is Cuba dealing and responding to, to the COVID situation? Well, just before we came on air, as it were, I was in conversation with Cuban friends to find out what was happening. And what they've told me is that at the present point in time, schools are closed in Cuba, but education is being conducted with the use of the television. There are two channels devoted specifically to education and children are able to access them uh, and, and to carry on with their education with materials given to them at the beginning of the year so that they have the, you know, the, the, the pens, the papers, et cetera, in order to be able to conduct that. University students uh, are, are conducting their studies remotely using uh, emails and laptops and so on uh, to do that work. And they have the resource and the possibility to go into libraries which are organized socially distanced so that people can go into them quite safely and carry on their education as well. Um, as far as, uh, and that applies to, to teachers as well and their access and, and links that they have. So the, the network of education is very much strong, is very strong and is very much continuing. The situation with COVID itself is that it has been quite serious. There have been, according to the latest re uh, reports, which are I've just gathered from yesterday, uh, there have been half a million cases uh, across Cuba. Uh, and of those, sadly, something like 440 people have died. Now, one of the things you have to appreciate is that Cuba is about one sixth of the size of the United Kingdom. So if you were talking about comparing the figures of Cuba to the United Kingdom, that would mean we would have seen something like 2,640 deaths in Britain. Now compare that with the actual reality. 125,000 people tragically have died as a result of COVID in Britain. Uh, Cuba takes health as education too extremely seriously uh, and cares for its population. Uh, the recovery rates in Cuba are phenomenal. Something like 91% of the people who have contracted COVID have actually 
recovered from it through nursing and through care and through treatment which Cuba developed when it was looking after patients in West Africa with Ebola. It developed certain uh, chemical uh, treatments, drugs, which were able to uh, help the body resist. They weren't uh, a vaccination against COVID or against Ebola, but they helped the body to react and respond and gave it strength. So there have been remarkable uh, recovery rates that have taken place in Cuba, as I've said. At, at the moment, they're engaged in um, research and uh, trials uh, for three vaccines that they have called Soberana 1 and 2 and Abdallah, which uh, they hope to uh, complete the trials and put them into service uh, and make them available with the intention of vaccinating the whole of the Cuban population uh, and also making that uh, th those uh, um, knowledge about those drugs available to other countries as well. Uh, in the course of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, Cuba has sent uh, medical uh, doctors abroad to help elsewhere across the globe. There have been uh, 50 brigades, and when I say a brigade, I don't mean individuals, I mean groups of medics, uh, doctors, nurses, and so on, who have gone to more than 40 countries across the world to help those health services uh, treat patients who are suffering from COVID, including uh, going to Italy. Uh, friends of mine who are doctors in, in, in Italy have told me about the work of Cuban doctors in Turin uh, and in the north of Italy, which was the most severely affected by COVID. And their work has been extremely welcomed. And they've also been in Andorra in Europe. So not just in uh, areas like uh, Africa and so on and other parts of the world, which have a low numbers of doctors, but even in areas uh, that I've mentioned, like Italy, with a relatively sophisticated, supposedly, um, health system. So Cuba's work on uh, the international brigades has been immense. Um, there's also a question here, and I don't know, Alpha, whether you'd like to take this or Karen, uh, right. about... I think I'm getting a notice that we are coming to the towards the end, I don't know. But Karen, if you want to say anything about, or Alpha, about the teaching of children with learning difficulties, with dyslexia and dyscalculia. I, I, I don't have a detailed answer. Shall I just jump in, Alpha? I have. <laughs> um, but I know I noticed that class sizes are much smaller. The ratio of pupils to adults um, is, is smaller than, than here in the UK, which can be one to 30 or above. So children are bound to get more individual attention. So whatever difficulties they might have, it's, it's much easier to teach uh, children um, and give them that individual attention that they need. In the example of dyslexia that the question's asking about, um, it, it's being able to adapt your teaching style to care Karen, to Sorry, it's not your fault. It's my bad management of time. Uh, so Alpha, with apologies, I'm going to have to stop it there. I do apologise. I just, actually, I do know something about dyscalculia, and that is that uh, a friend of mine who's a, a retired professor of neuropsychology at uh, University London went to Cuba with a friend of his who specialised in dyscalculia, and they've tested 30,000 pupils uh, in order to diagnose uh, the uh, you know, the extent to which uh, it, it's a problem in Cuba and they're doing work on it. So they, it's incredible the way they respond to these educational issues and take them up in a very uh, concrete way, but in a very uh, detailed educational and scientific way of examining what the needs are. Can I thank everybody who's participated in it and all of those who've attended? We've had more than 50 people present and I'm very grateful for you. Many of you having been at conference and spent a hard day uh, not a hard day in a negative sense, but uh, you know a challenging time listening to to speakers and paying attention to the debate. So I'm very grateful to everybody who's been on this call. I want to thank Alpha and Karen in particular, and Nyerka who spoke earlier, and Kevin, and to again invite all of you to join the Cuba Solidarity Campaign, to affiliate your branch and to become actively participating in solidarity with a country that takes education seriously and values our solidarity. Thank you very much indeed.